Felipe, thank you very much for making time thank to you. share your insights into the future. But before we go into the future, can we can you tell us a little bit more about your own background? Sure. Where did you grow up? Um, so I'm a I'm a big city girl, born and bred in Soweto. So grew up in the townships in South Africa. Um, and I come from a very small nuclear family. Um, so mom, dad, and I have an identical twin sister. Right. And that's it. We've got no other siblings. So grew up quite close. Um, my dad has since passed on, but my mom is still with us. Um, even though she's, of course, a lot older now and struggling a little bit health-wise, but we're still grateful to have her. And she's uh, very hands-on with her grandkids. This is the right. fourth one on the way. Um, and very much involved in our lives because she's only got the two daughters. So very close-knit family. Um, both my sister and I are engineers. She's yeah. a civil engineer. I'm a mining engineer. Right. No other engineers in our family before us and none after. If I, I'd have to think about that. I, don't, I can't think of anyone who's gone on to, to do that. Yeah. Obviously, people have gone on to dif do different things in the extended family. Um, yeah, I think I believe I had a very visionary father um, right. who was very involved in his get girl children, especially in our education. But I think also just generally in stretching us to believe more was possible and not to be restricted by anything, by circumstance, by money or the lack thereof, by location, anything. He right. just believed we could achieve whatever we put our minds to and he inculcated that in us from a very young age. Um, and really pushed for education, much like many men and women of their generation, they pushed us to, to study and to make better of ourselves. And I think we've gone on to do, we've both gone on to do very well. They're, and, they're very proud. And tell us, what was your dream career in your early days? I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Um, mm -hmm. My mom is a nurse. Um, she discouraged it, thank goodness. I so appreciate it now. Um, she took me with her to a, an ICU ward once and I said never again. <laughs> so um, medicine was always the automatic choice if your child was kind of bright, um, was good at math and, and science, etc. But it just in the end wasn't for me. I'm actually, I'm very glad I studied engineering. I enjoyed studying it. Um, was very mathematically inclined as a child. A little bit geeky, no, right. uh, nerdy, um, very bookish, uh, I suppose, as they'd no. say. I'd love to read, spent a lot of time indoors, both my sister and I. And I think we pushed each other just because we're both academically inclined. We just pushed each other to be better. So spent, I spent a lot of time studying as a teenager and um, wasn't the partying, clubbing right. kind of child. No. So what attracted you to engineering? Um the math and I mean I knew I, I knew I was good at math I knew I was good at science um, and I knew I needed I wanted to do something technical mm. interestingly at first when I was just towards the end of high school um, my sister and I were discussing what we wanted to study she wanted to be a civil engineer and she went on to study it and qualified she still practices as a civil engineer mm. so she's just one of those people who happened to meet her love career and followed it and continues to follow it follow it she really enjoys the construction side of things and i thought i wanted to be a mechanical engineer and we visited an open day at wits university together she of course went to civil engineering she loved it and then we went to school of mechanical engineering together because that's what i thought i wanted to study right. and it just didn't talk to me for many reasons there were lots of big turbines there it was very cold it i felt like the lecturers were a little bit unapproachable right. um and then i was stuck so i had to go and do my research and visit all the different schools of engineering and I happened to bump into mining engineering. It was never a plan. I didn't know it existed. Um, and it spoke to me, you know, that the lecturers were warm and friendly and informative. Um, the students seemed like people I could identify with. Look, my parents weren't exactly ecstatic when I announced that this is what I was going to study. Um, my mom worried for my safety, of course. Um, but it worked out. It worked out. And I believe you started your career at BHP Billiton. I did. <laughs> I did. As a marketing manager. Actually, I started on the mine. So I finished at BHP Billiton as a marketing manager. So yeah. selling coal and coal related products. But I actually started my career at Samanco Chrome before BHP Billiton sold it. Mm -hmm. They sold it to a Russian company called Kermis. So I spent two years at a very small town called Steelput. It's a chrome mining town. So I was working on at Eastern Chrome Mines um, as a mine planner. So helping the guys underground kind of think in longer term horizons. When you work underground, you kind of map each day's production and plan for the next day's production. 
and at the end of the week you can tally what you did for the week etc um, which is fine there's room for that sort of planning but um, mining companies run on three to five year mm. cycles and then they can do 20 year plans right. that's what they disclose to their shareholders thinking around well what's the longevity and the life of mine here so um, I was of no real use underground to the guys I wasn't as strong as they were I wasn't as um, as versatile as they could be. I just couldn't lift what they could lift. I couldn't do everything that they could do. Um, I obviously had lots to learn, but I had a skill set that they identified they could use because everything that they did was very manual and very paper-based. Um, and we had a little survey office on the mine that had an old computer that ran some software that I happened to have used when I was at university. And so I was able to help them automate a lot of their mind planning and do it a lot faster, but also start to think in longer horizons. So I had some value to them. So and where is Steelport? Sure. Steelport is, if you know where Burgess Fort is, Burgess Fort is a platinum mining town. Yeah. Burgess Fort is about, it's just less than 20 Ks from Steelport, maybe 12 or 14 Ks if I'm not mistaken. Leidenburg is about 60 Ks from Steelport. Okay. It's kind of equidistant between Polokwane to Steelport and Steelport to, to Whitbank. It's, so it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. So how did you keep yourself busy other than work? Um, oh, it's interesting. Um, Work, yes. Um, yeah, I was new to a small mining town, so got to know the community a bit. Um, I was a new driver, so I explored a lot. I went to right. the Kruger a lot. It was quite easy to get to the Kruger National okay. Park and to Hraskop and to, to the Lofelt and right. to that sort of belt. So I did a lot of sightseeing and touring. And then driving home would take me probably about four hours. So at the worst, I just came to Joburg. Right. And I believe from uh, mining you went into project finance, you yeah. joined Standard Bank. Yeah. So at that time, if you if you think back to almost around 2007 to 2000 and 2006, 2007, we were in a commodities boom in the country. Gold was at its ultimate highest price um, and everyone was really bullish on gold and all commodities in fact. And Standard Bank was growing their mining franchise in project finance, but also in corporate finance and structured finance. There were a number of teams involved in mining and they were looking for mining qualified people, but who had some commercial inclination to join the bank. I didn't know anything about investment banking. Once again, it's, it wasn't really part of the plan. I happened to be speaking at a women in mining breakfast and I bumped into, I met a lady called Sune Bruchman. She's now the chief risk officer for the corporate and investment bank, but she was at the same event. And she said to me, I think you've got a good personality for investment banking. I didn't know what she meant. Um, and then she kind of like um, invited me over to the bank for a day. And in that day I spent a, a number of hours with different teams involved in mining whether they were debt or equity finance teams or advisory teams, but just getting a sense of what a bank does with mining type stuff. And I was really intrigued. I was interested. It's not something I'd ever thought about and um, decided um, to follow uh, project finance as a track it, because project finance is extremely technical. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to interpret technical documents. Bankable feasibility studies are very technical documents. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it spoke to my background, especially in mine planning. Um, just understanding the life of mine, understanding what the role of the mining company is and then starting to understand what the role of a funder is and where we get involved, where we play, where we wouldn't play. Um, and I joined Standard Bank, but I joined Standard Bank and they knew I was going to go and do my MBA. So I think I worked for three or four months with them and then left for a year to go and do my MBA full time. Okay. Yeah. Which in was, Cape Town? Yes. Yes. Which was quite generous, actually. So I spent a year in Cape Town um, studying full time. It is the way to do an MBA, in my view. I've got a number of colleagues who are doing it now, uh, married, some with young right. kids. It's tough to juggle with work. I I didn't have children, um, and so I could do, park you my did career. MBA at UCT. Yes, full okay. time. Yeah, for the full year, mm. and then I went to Cambridge University on exchange. So right. I extended by another quarter, and then I returned to the bank. Okay. Yeah, and all in all, I think I spent almost ten years. Um, it's then a bank. Yeah. I had a great career at Standard Bank. Um, it's a great company. It's, yeah. it, it's extremely well run. And I think 
in retrospect more so than even when i was there i recognize how much work they've done to create a pan-african platform it's not easy to do um, but they're very conscious about doing it and building leaders from across the continent and integrating parts of the bank across the continent right. getting rid of the south african lens as much as possible um, so I started out just doing mining deals in South Africa and then I started working in Mozambique, Botswana because there were coal fines in Botswana um, right. and in Mozambique a massive coke and coal find there so I started working on those projects and the Africa bug bit you know I had started seeing parts of the continent I'd never been to I traveled a bit um, yeah. my twin sister happens to be married to a Namibian so my family is somewhat pan-African um, in a way um, and we'd been to different parts of southern Africa mm. but once I started venturing out further going to Sierra Leone going to West Africa going to East Africa then mm. really starting to see a lot of the continent then and then I got an opportunity to move to West Africa to Ghana right. I spent four years working for Standard Bank in Ghana just less than four years yeah. um, from 2011 to 2015 and um, initially just helping them build out their mining energy and infrastructure finance mm. portfolio there because that's the bulk of the work that I'd done in South Africa. Um, and then the bank opened in Cote d'Ivoire as well. I don't mm. speak French. I don't speak French well. I have mm. a basic understanding of French. But there was a small team of us that uh, some of them were responsible for helping to get the banking license. I was helping to set up the in investment banking kind of service, mm. particularly because it's a country that's rich in oil and gas. Mm. And I'd done by then quite a bit of work in oil and gas in Nigeria and in Ghana. Unfortunately, in Ghana, at, by the time I arrived in 2011, in 2012, there was a, a big accident on an underground gas tube that kind of right. cut off gas supply to the country. Okay. So any financing activity that we would have done into the gas industry in Ghana stopped for a period of i think it was two or three years just before i left it kind of picked up again right but yeah got to learn a lot about that industry as well which is similar to mining but also very different and i believe from there you joined a leadership firm yes i joined a company called egon zenda actually i returned home with standard bank so they repatriated me home yeah. um, for a bigger role so i took over responsibility for east and west africa um, looking after many power and infrastructure transactions, so a little less mining, but power in East and West Africa was was um, gas or oil-fired power. Um, and then in East Africa, a number of other different things that we were looking at in the infrastructure space. So um, it was a great move, but I was traveling a lot. Um, had a young son at the time, he was probably four or five. Um, and also, I think I'd spent, I'd spent almost a decade doing what I was doing. I was pretty good at it, but um, I just felt like there had to be more out there. Um, having lived in West Africa for about four years, I, I became very frustrated by the lack of what I felt was a lack of transformation in South Africa. Okay. I just felt like it bothered me a lot that a number of leaders didn't look like me. Um, and it bothered me being the first what what of everything you know um and being the most senior and the most it just really bothered me that i was the only one not that i was one but the fact that there was just the, i couldn't see a whole mass of supply following after me and the shoes that people would have to fill after me would just become increasingly bigger because the barriers were getting higher and i felt like i wanted to be a part of changing that narrative in south africa right um Egon Zenda approached me. At first, I thought they were looking, a client of theirs was looking for me for a job. And then they actually said, we thought you might be interested in joining us. Again, never knew anything about executive search or leadership advisory at all. Right. Um, but the company resonated with me. I actually loved the work that they do. Um, loved the international um, footprint. Having done the African stint, it was actually nice to be part of a true global multinational company and also to be surrounded by some really smart people. If there's one thing that's impressive about Egon Zende is you meet some phenomenal people. I don't know where they find them all, but you meet some really, really great people. Um, and so I joined Egon Zenda and kind of um, halfway through my first year, Old Mutual became a client. Right. At that time, um, managed separation had been announced. Mm -hmm. They were looking to um, kind of look at the profile of the exco readiness for listing, etc. So I worked with the then CEO and the then HR director. And when that project finished, we then moved on to work with the board on a similar type of assignment. Right. Um, because uh, Ralph and Peter, who was the CEO, then resigned um, yeah. in November of 2016. Um, 
the I think I would say that the leadership of Old Mutual PLC really wanted some support for the chairman locally um, because there were a number of decisions that were midway, particularly around the board, new board appointments. If we actually like completely rehashed the board in 2017. So I joined in May of 2017 as Trevor Manuel's executive assistant, working on a number of things for the board um, right. around managed separation. And then Peter Moyer joined a month after me. Yeah. And then three months later, I became chief of staff, working working for both of them, interestingly, right. but mainly for Peter. Kedive, today you are the group director for HR. Um, what does that encompass? And maybe can you share a couple of highlights yeah. from your HR career? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, you know, not planned. I must be honest. It's not. It's not what I ever thought I'd be doing. Even when I was at at Egon Zenda, although you would think there are some similarities, it's not what I thought I would end up doing. Even when I joined Old Mutual, but the opportunity has been fantastic. Um, I, I honestly credit Peter. I credit Peter Moyo for that appointment and for that forethought. Um, we had a conversation. I had conversations with different people when the role became available. I had been chief of staff for a year. It's not something you can do longer than 18 months max. It's exhausting, to be honest, um, especially at that level consistently. So I was looking to settle into a role and that one became available. I'd spent a year kind of understanding the executive priorities of the company, strategically where we were going to go, um, what the board's thoughts were. Um, and I felt like I was in a really good position to translate that overall strategy into a people space. So I see my role very much as a business transformation role. It's really not a, a traditional HR role with the greatest of respect to, to the profession. I say that because also we were very intentional about getting non-traditional HR skills into that role. Right. I think there's a good understanding. Old Mutual has very solid people practices. So well-established policies, procedures, practices, that stuff is very well done. Um, what the what at the time was needed, was felt was needed, was something different. A mm. different way of thinking, a different way of approaching it and to build something new. Right. Um, so we changed the name to Human Capital from Human Resources um, and I got appointed in May of last year. So... I've been in the role now for about a year, almost a year and a half, if I'm not mistaken. Now looking back over your career, obviously there have been a number of turning points. Yeah. And what is your advice for future leaders? How should they handle turning points in their own career? When they have the option to go this way, how should they and how did you maybe yeah. make that decision? You know, for me, Nick, I think I heard someone ask a question at a panel discussion around the skill that we that children should be equipped with for the future. And everyone was like analytical skills and maths and mm. deductive thinking and stuff. And all of those are important skills. But most importantly, he said that we need to inculcate in our children the ability to live comfortably as if they were nomads. In other words, or refugees, like you've got right. no place to stay. You're not sure of your citizenship. Mm. You're not sure of your job or your food or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And every day you've got to make something of it mm. because the reality is change is the only consistent thing that's going to happen to us professionally now. No career is going to remain stagnant for a long mm. period of time. No career is going to remain the same. And so for me, I think the biggest thing that future leaders have to be comfortable with is change and the propensity to change change right. and once things become very familiar very structured very orderly it's time, it's time to change to move on. Okay. it's time to change um and that's it's funny when i think back on my career as as unplanned as it was it has yeah. been about consistent reinvention and change um and i've challenged myself and learned a lot and taken big leaps sometimes very risky and and you do have to take risk um right. but oftentimes very very rewarding and i'm very happy with the work that i get to do now um, I turned 40 this year, so it's a different season in my life. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm old per se, but older and right. more mature in my career. And it's great to be in a function that allows you to have broader impact. I really feel like I have broad impact, not like because we care about people and we pay them and we take mm. care of them. It's, it's really impact around helping people think very effectively about their careers and the careers that they build, whether they build them with old mutual or not. Mm. That's my view. Right. I just think you have to prepare people for good careers. And if that career continues with you, that's fantastic. But even if they leave, they become great ambassadors for the brand that you've built internally if you do it right. So I'm really passionate about careers and growing careers, my own and other people's, um, and people who are really energetic about pushing and driving for better. Right. Um, I'm also generally quite a high energy person, I've learned. And so having to keep the, the momentum going, especially yeah. as you're 
audience or your influence gets larger mm. is actually quite exhausting. When your team is small, you can have the conversation and sure. everybody can be gung ho and ready to go. It's taken work mm. to to create a vision around which everybody can rally. Mm. Um, and also because I'm not an I'm not a traditional HR person, so I don't know how to run a talent practice or a reward practice or a, an organizational design practice. But I'm fine with that. I'm pretty comfortable with that. I believe I have to find the right people and I have the right people to do those things. Mine is to lead them. Mine is to create the the vision and the direction so that we can all be aligned around it and then push forward. Right. Um, and it's also helped me not dabble in their work too much. Um, Sure, I have views and mm. I, I have um, uh, preferences around the direction mm. we should go, but they are professionals in their own right. They know exactly what they need to be able to do. And uh, for me, there's is just to come up for air and say, okay, here's where, when it's enterprise-wide stuff, where are we going? What are we building? How do we get ourselves there? So very much a helicopter view. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And I've been quite blessed with that, I must say. Even um, with the leadership transitions we've had at Old Mutual, um, I don't think you can be an effective HR director without a supportive CEO and CFO. Right. That triad has to work very closely together. And I'm fortunate to have that. I've had that support since I started and I continue to have that support. So really understanding what the CEO's agenda is across the organization, what the strategy is going to be, what are we building, where are we angling ourselves mm. to. And then for me, where the CFO helps has really been in terms of of structure and process and funding, mm. finding the money that we need. Right. We've just put we've just put a significant investment into overhauling our human capital management mm. system. So from a technology and a technology enablement perspective, it wasn't necessarily something that we envisioned. A year ago, we had just come back from San Francisco thinking this would be a great thing to do. Mm. You know, a year later, we've just gone live in six and a half our countries and we'll go live on the other half by the end of Q1. It's a significant financial investment, but right. a financial investment that solely benefits our people, which I think right. is great. It's going to be wonderful for all mutualites to have an equity of experience from an HR perspective mm. and simplifying the transactional side of that mm. of that work. So whether it's around taking leave, um, performance appraising your employees, mm. creating a career development plan, accessing learning, things that at the moment, to be honest with you, are quite labor intensive right especially for line managers and being able to plan it and make sure that their people have access to it so looking back over your early career and maybe your early days when you grew up who inspired you yeah. you mentioned your father yeah my father was a great influence um i revered my dad i looked mm. up to him he seemed to know everything he was mm. just a very well-read man and my dad kind of missed Bantu education. He was born in 1940. So as that was starting, I think he was mm. transitioning into high school. He was very well read, very linguistically gifted. Mm. So both my sister and I speak the bulk of South African languages. I think I speak nine languages in South Africa. As I said, she's married to a Namibian. She speaks the local language there. Her right. children are fluent in German. She's learning German. So mm. it's been a, a big part of his legacy to leave behind. I looked up to my dad a lot. I revered him. He was somewhat of a hero figure in mm. our family, being surrounded by three women. Um, so that was great. Um, it's evolved through life. Hey, I had some exceptional teachers in high school. I had an exceptional English teacher who I think we underestimate the need to be able to speak well as a leader, to be able to not be afraid of crowds and be able to deliver a message succinctly in a way that connects with a small or a large audience. Right. She had the ability to teach us that and to teach us how to write in a way that you could bring an audience in. It's a skill that I value to this day. I mean, I was in the debating team at school and in public speaking, I was that way inclined. I was right. not sporty, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so that I believe that sort of stuff has helped me to this day. Um, yeah, I had and, some exceptional teachers along the way. And uh, Kadiwe, what is driving you today? Um, sure. Um, the day I leave this job, I want to leave it better than I found it. And whatever better means. Um, Old Mutual is on a journey, and I think all large corporates, especially large, long legacy uh, corporates are on the same journey of reinvention, making themselves relevant, not wanting to be disintermediated, all of those sort of things. I don't think there's a company that you'll talk to that isn't concerned fundamentally about disruption. For me, it's one, welcoming it and embracing it. It's here, whether we like it or not, we can't run away from it, we can't avoid it. 
how do we future fit our own organization but our people as well to get ready for the change that is upon us right. that change is necessary because the world has changed just the way that we all transact i did all my black friday shopping online i didn't go into any massive Good. stampedes Good. <laughs> <laughs> i found the deals that i wanted and i was able to shop for them and they'll get delivered at my house right. and i know it's a basic example but all of us are consuming music the same way we're ordering our food the same way we're ordering whatever sure. of course we can um get into shops etc what i'm saying is the freedom of choice has become a way that people are transacting and they expect that ease of transacting and dealing with things wherever they go whether um it's when they're purchasing something as a customer or as an employee they want that ease of transacting they want that ease of experience they want to feel like the world is about them and as selfish as that is, it's just where we've gone. Mm. In our family, everybody has a Netflix profile and everybody's determining what they want to watch when. That's sure. just the world that we're living in. Mm. Um, and so if we can't get comfortable with that and we can't evolve, particularly the workplace, to, to create that same sort of seamless interaction, but also sense of individuality, I just think that large companies will cease to exist. Right. Now, talking about leadership, Kaliwe, what would you say... What does the future of leadership mean to you? And how do you see leadership evolve? Yeah, I think leadership has evolved to being less autocratic and all-knowing mm. and has become a deeply vulnerable place. Mm. I, I love Brene Brown, um, have read her books and follow her um, on every social media platform possible. Yeah. And she writes a lot about vulnerability, but mm. about the strength of being vulnerable. And I don't think vulnerability is about weakness and and necessarily tears and falling into a small heap because everything is is rough it's really recognizing what i don't know right what i can't do and where can i find that where can i access that um i always share with people that i love the fact that she says vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity change and innovation if you can't be vulnerable you can never be creative right. you can't be innovative you'll never welcome change because mm. your view of yourself is almost all-knowing so for me the future of leadership is about that it's about the depth mm. of self of knowledge of self really mm. understanding who you are warts and all we all have positives mm. but we have negatives as well understanding your own challenges as a leader being open about what those challenges are but always pushing to improve who we are you know as people and accepting the fact that things are going to change as much as possible and innovation is going to come from places that we least expect it and being right. open to to receiving that now what have you learned from your own journey if there's one quality that you would consider most important for building future leaders what is it you would tell them um Jack Walsh, for me, said it best. You know, he said that if the world on the outside is changing faster than the world on the inside, then the end is near. Mm. Again, for me, it is this extreme comfort with the fact that it is going to change. And the day I get called in and I'm told my job is changing, the company is moving, whatever, it's, mm. it's, it's that level of comfort with change that I have to have. Right. Um, I just don't think that leaders of the future can afford to be comfortable with any form of status quo. We've got to be pushing and agitating forward, but knowing that that direction may, may change. It may be changed by us, it may be changed by the forces around us. I think it also forces us to have a high external orientation. That's what Jack Walsh was, was arguing for. He may be swallowing his words now with some of the challenges at, at GE, but be, it as, be that as it may, he was right. You've got to be looking at what is happening on the outside, what's influencing life in general. And unfortunately, as future leaders, I don't even think we have the luxury of focusing on what's happening in insurance or what's happening in financial services. We have to think about what's happening in telecoms, what's happening in entertainment, what's happening in every single possible industry because it influences every customer who interacts with us and it influences every employee who may want to join us. The very same employee we're dealing with could be considering a career opportunity at any one of those industries. It no longer matters, actually. Um, and so for me, it's it's those sorts of things that that keep me that keep me energized about what the future holds because right. it's going to be constantly evolving and constantly changing, and the influences are going to come from many different places. Now, obviously, one uh, place where influences are coming from is social media. So when you speak to future leaders and maybe even your own children. What is it you tell them? How should they handle and navigate social media to build their own brand? Yeah, I think there's great positives and unfortunately challenges mm. and negatives to social media as well. 
Um, I use LinkedIn a lot as a professional mm. um, platform. I'm not very active on Facebook and Twitter, mm. just because I think you need to separate out your personas as much as possible. For me, Facebook is a mm. is a is a personal tool, sharing mm. pictures of your kids. LinkedIn is very much a professional platform, and I use it a lot mm. for that. Um, I found it's great for connecting with people, mm. connecting with people that I currently work with, I may future in future mm. work with, sharing views and opinions. I read a lot on LinkedIn. Mm. Probably when I when I go to bed, my preferred place of reading is on LinkedIn. Uh, there's okay. enough people that I follow and I can read about leaders and I can read about things influencing my industry and all sorts. And of course, track people's work anniversaries and stuff like that as well, which is the mundane part of right. LinkedIn. But also, I must say, I've, I've also learned a lot about social media and media, particularly in the year that Old Mutual has had. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a bit of a bloodbath from that perspective in the public domain. And the fact that people people believe a lot of what's written and mm. irrespective of what the source may be, irrespective of what the rigor may be around it, people will believe it. It's easy to consume. Right. It's easy to read. We've just, um, as a leadership team, all of us finished a road show to all of our staff in South Africa, got physically on the road and visited a number of our regions, just talking about the year, right. talking about um, a number of the challenges we faced and um, particularly our, our former CEO as well. Just talking about what happened, I think owning the mistakes, owning what we could have done better, listening for how it has been for people, particularly Mm. our frontline staff who deal with customers on a day-to-day basis. Customers are reading exactly the same stuff. Um, And so it's made it very difficult for them. And then there was a dead body recently. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, so you're, you're you're deriving lessons. You're saying. Oh you're yeah. Oh yeah. I, and mm. I think they're valuable lessons. Mm. I think they're valuable lessons in um, how to prepare ourselves, how to mm. communicate succinctly and clearly, um, and and how to be able to I think represent our own truth in the midst of that. And we possibly haven't done that well. I think we've accepted that. I think there are things at the start of this that from a communication perspective in the public domain, we could have just done better um, that we didn't um, because we weren't prepared. No one, no one really thought, no one in any shape or form thought it would go this way. Um, But we've learned a lot from it. And I think the big leadership lesson for us, especially as the executive leadership team, is how we get through this. Mm. You know, what happens will happen. And a lot of it is actually out of our control. What is in our control is how we get through it and how we get our organization through it. And that's what we're owning. And that's what we're kind of now stewarding um, going forward. And I think that's great. So what, how has this year and uh, what has happened this year, how has this changed your outlook on communications? Mm. Communicating to your staff, communicating to the public, communicating to clients. Yeah. Look, I've, one thing I've learned, particularly from a staff perspective and from key stakeholders, mm. is nothing beats the in-person interaction. Mm. When you can look people eyeball mm. to eyeball and they can read your body language and you mm. can read theirs and you can answer their questions, it just beats any group-wide email notification you may send out, um, any sends announcements, because anything can be read and then reread into mm. or misinterpreted or reinterpreted in a way maybe that you don't intend. But the face-to-face interaction that we've had, both with our key stakeholders, so the same roadshow we did with our staff, we did with a number of our big stakeholders as well. Right. And it's amazing how many people have just said thank you. Thank you for mm. making the time. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being open and humble about it. And, you know, we're going to continue working, w- walking this journey together. Mm. Um, and as technologically advanced as we get, and as much as I am open and welcome mm. that advancement, very much so, I do think that from a communications perspective, as a leader, more is demanded from you because mm. you just have to make the time to interact right. to even with your own direct team. We shouldn't miss that personal touch of checking in with people. You know, how many of us know the names of our team's spouses, their kids, mm. where they live, um, some of their own personal challenges that they may be facing coming into the workplace. I think we've got to retain that humanity in the midst of technological advancement. That's been a big lesson for me this year. Right. Now, talking about overcoming obstacles, um, obviously, that's almost the law of life. Um, life will throw obstacles in your way. So what is it you would tell future leaders? How should they handle obstacles in their leadership journey? And what kind of obstacles should they expect in their journey into the future? Sure. I don't think you can create any expectation around those obstacles. They could be anything. Mm. Um, any of the major obstacles that I've faced in my career to date, I could have never called them. Never, ever call them. Um, but I guess the thing is to expect that obstacles will come. Mm. You know, I think a great leadership trait is how you respond at the time when those obstacles are thrown mm. at you. When times are really, really tough, 
Mm. What does it bring out of you? What are you saying? How are you behaving? What are people experiencing mm. of you? For me, that's what differentiates the best leaders from from leaders in general. It's really people will remember, geez, that was a tough time. It was a tough year. Right. But our leader pulled us through. You know, they were available. They were accessible. They were humble. They, they let us know when they were struggling. Because you do struggle. There right. are times when it's also tough on you. Um, mm. And there are times when people just need to hear that. I know that it's hard. Mm. You know, a lot of our sales staff just needed to hear that. That I know that this has been mm. hard. I know that it impacts you personally in a way that it possibly doesn't impact me because every time you sit in front of a customer and they say to you really like with everything that's going on right now it's really hard and people just want to know that you have that level of empathy for them and whatever you can do within your power to 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 shift that situation you can um we shouldn't lose that i I think that's the only thing that's going to distinguish us as we get through obstacles there will be others this is not the last one we will face others now, Kelibe, um, if you were to design, and maybe you are, if you were to design a curriculum for future leaders, what are the new skills you would want to factor in? <laughs> sure. Maybe just one or two. Well, leading through change would be a big one. Right. Um, and just sticking to the basics. I think you can't underestimate getting your like getting the basic things right um whatever industry you're in you know i think one of the things that i've learned certainly having moved into human capital is the the great need to be able to understand the fundamentals of the business that we're in um is to be able to speak business speak rather than than hr speak in my instance other people may have operations speak or Mm. or other functions um and i think it it distinguishes us as leaders if we're able to be aligned around what the business needs so for me when i say sticking to the basics it's really understanding what makes this business run what are the critical factors behind it um what are our customers looking for getting as close to to that voice as possible and making sure that what you're driving for is 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 achieving that customers have choice they have big choices absolutely now, um, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored somebody formally or informally and that person took your advice to heart and it, it, it had an impact in their life? Yeah, so I've, I think I've been quite fortunate with that. I'm, I'm quite deliberate with mentorship, so I don't take on a lot of mentees right. because I just believe it's something you've got to do, put the right mm. time in and um, be able to invest a lot of yourself in getting that person wherever they may be. I don't believe in perpetual mentorship, but over a period of time, I do. I've mentored people out of careers and out of companies that I was in, as crazy that, as that sounds, just because it was the best opportunity for them. And because the growth that they were seeking or the opportunity that they were looking for was never going to happen for them where we both were. Right. And it was around, well, what does the future need to look like for you? What are you getting comfortable with? What is it that you're looking for, etc.? And how do we get you there? Right. So I've been quite fortunate to be involved in those sorts of career trajectories for people. But I've also had a few tough mentees who've just been comfortable with where they are, mm. where I believe you see more in them than they see in themselves. And you almost have to agitate them to right. <laughs> to see that as well. Um, when they get there, it's completely mm. rewarding, um, um, which is lovely to see. Yeah. And getting to, to coach them and share. A lot of my mentorship style is really around sharing. It's around listening a lot. Um, giving my perspective to things, but also allowing people to figure things out right. um, with a few pointers. And the next time we meet, well, what is your thinking been? Um, how do you think it could do this differently? Mm. How do we approach? Um, I must say also my mentorship approach, and that's why I mentor a lot of people internally rather than externally, to be honest, wherever mm-hmm. I work, is because I firmly believe that people need more sponsors than mentors. Mentors are great. Um, they can give advice. They can share their own journeys. They can um, help you build. But sponsors remove barriers. They escalate right. you. They, they, they accelerate you in a way that a mentor never can. Right. And a lot of my preference is to sponsor people through an organization. I really am where I am because I was personally sponsored. I feel yeah. people chose me specifically for specific mm. roles, not in a way that was unfair and breached any sort of process, but really identified the fact that, hey, you could be really good at this. You should consider this as a move. How right. about doing this, etc.? And not necessarily having to go through painful and laborious processes to make the next step. You know, many of my next steps were unplanned and that is, that's grace in and of itself is grace. It's people, it's people favoring you, quite frankly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So are there any, are there any role models of leadership um, that you would recommend future leaders should study and maybe learn from? 
Sure, I follow all sorts of people. Um, yeah. I um, recently read Michelle Obama's book, and that for me is is leadership from the back. Many, right. much of what she went through, people don't know about, um, in being the spouse to a to the U.S. president mm. and the personal sacrifices she took on, because she's a very intelligent and successful woman in her own right. Um, I learned a lot from from that book. Right. Um, locally, you know, I have a few people. I have a great admiration for Peter Moyo. I think he's a he's a He's a fantastic leader. He's the type of person who can drive change. He's fearless, as mm. you can see. <laughs> He's completely fearless mm. um, and completely without boundaries. And right. when you're, when a person like that gives you room, you can fly. Um, so I learned a lot from him. Um, um, I've learned a lot from from Trevor too. To be honest, I right. started working for him. Um, I am not. I'm completely apolitical as a person, and of course, he's not at old mutual because of politics, but uh, because of his own leadership qualities and sure. the work he did in the finance ministry. But also understanding, I think, as young people, we tend to forget where our country has come from, the sacrifices, but also the personalities. He's got. A wealth of stories and experiences around what it was like, what it took, right. what happened, who was there, um, and I've had a great um, benefit of yeah. of of hearing about that and learning right. about that and challenging myself about a different type of leadership that I wouldn't have considered. So, so both of them have been huge influences on my life. Right. Um, yeah, and the rest is I. I mean, I have a fantastic husband who mm -hmm. I, I really look up to as a leader. It's very different to me. Um, his approach is a lot less uh, um, rigorous and possibly a lot less possibly aggressive than mine. If I if, if I if I had to find words, not because I'm saying he's soft, he's not. Mm -hmm. But we lead differently. Um, right. And what's great is I think we. Um, we balance those energies off of each other. Yes. Mm -hmm. In times where I might be a little bit too decisive too quickly, mm -hmm. he can pull me back and say, look, consider X, Y, and Z before you do that. Right. And in times where he's too um, given too much leeway or he's too self um admonishing for certain things i can i can go back to him and say to him listen trey right. don't worry about this you know this is about you you've got to focus here you've got to do that so we're quite fortunate and i think as a woman especially when you reach executive levels you actually as a married woman you mm. cannot do it without that level of partnership it's impossible um either you're in a, a partnership where one of you needs to step down and function and, and be the one in the home whether that's the husband or the wife and that's fine i don't right. see an issue with that um our family is not like that we're one of those families where both of us are in executive careers yes we have a lot of support and extended family etc but it's a a relationship of, of mutual respect and of mutual trust and one that we believe our kids will benefit from seeing uh, how can our listeners get hold of you and where should they follow you <laughs> LinkedIn is the best way to follow me right. on a professional platform LinkedIn is, is best I'm not on Twitter at all um, LinkedIn I'm very active on um, yeah. and it's easy to kind of reach me there and um, try to get together for a conversation Right. As I said, I mean, I, a lot of my mentoring relationships are internal mm. um, and I find I speak in places and people always try to approach for that. Mm. Um, there's a number of reasons. I, I actually believe in millennials for right. I don't like the term, but I think they're challenging for the right things. Um, sometimes maybe not in the right way, but challenging mm. for the right things. Um, and that voice is one we need to. I think consciously listen to mm. as we evolve in the workplace. For me, it's a lot like that Pretoria girls um, uprising about Afro hair at work right. at, at at school um, was very real for me. Just because um, I went to schools where I was in the minority and my hair had to be pulled back and done all sorts of things too. My hair is worn naturally and it's big and loud or short and. Right. Um, kinky and it does all sorts of things but a lot of it has become about my own identity and when those girls did what they did at Victoria Girls and I went to a girls mm. school myself I wondered why did we not do that why did we why did we not feel we could speak out in the way that they had and right. so I think for me that has become a pivotal point around why that voice is important to listen to I'm not saying they have all the answers and I'm not saying that the approach is necessarily mm. right My executive assistant is a millennial and oftentimes I'm driving home and I'm just like, I cannot believe that's even possible. Mm. But there are many things that we've had in conversation and spoken about and I'm like, okay, mm. I can I can understand why that would be important, why we need to start thinking about that. Right. So so I listen to her a lot. She probably reverse mentors me a lot okay. um, and challenges me to, to just think, to mm. think differently all the time. So it's a voice I value.
And last but not least, Kaliwe, is there one piece of advice that you would really like to convey to future leaders that they should implement in their own lives and in their leadership? Yeah, I just I think it's important to remain open. Mm. Um, it sounds simple, but leadership is hard. Mm. It's so lonely. Um, mm. It's not easy always to trust everyone around you mm. um, and therefore not knowing always who you can talk to. But mm. the openness is the openness to receive, to listen, mm. to hear, to be challenged, to change. Um, yeah, to, to radically challenge what you've always thought was normal or the norm. It's a, it's a continuing leadership lesson for right. me. Well, Kadibe, thank you so much for sharing your leadership journey thank you, and your insights into the future. Nick, thank you for coming. I appreciate you. This is a lot easier for me than on the phone. So thank you very much. Thank you and uh, looking forward to see you in the future. <laughs> <laughs>